in the not too distant future we'll find ways to repair damaged brain whether we can do it to completely reconstitute it because if it's gone it's gone if you have a part of the brain that, that houses emotional memories and it's wiped then it's wiped you can you may be able to kind of regenerate the neurons and they'll connect up again but it won't be the same connection yeah. So it may be that, you know, some things are lost and they're lost forever. I mean, that would be amazing. You could, you know, show a brain-damaged person a portfolio of personalities <laughs> and they could, you know, they could choose. And then the surgeons would get to work and wire things up in the appropriate fashion. You could do that on a kind of recreational basis. You could just have a little chip that's inserted, so like, I, I think I'll ratchet up my extroversion by a few... Levels and this is not too far fetched. No, no, not at all. Not really. I think, in principle, there's no reason not to. Clearly, that at the moment, there are technical obstacles, but you know, things that we couldn't have imagined 50 years ago we, are kind of everyday life now. So. Does that present ethical issues for you, or because you do think that we're a collection of neurons essentially? Um, who cares? I think that the, the ethical issues are the, are the root of the whole matter. So we will have to confront lots of ethical issues, uh, as we do at the moment. I mean, whether people live or die, whether they're resuscitated, um, passive versus active euthanasia. These are these are these are live issues. These are live ethical issues, and uh, mostly clinicians are pragmatic folk and they muddle through. But when you come to look at the, the really the deep ethical issues, they're, they're the only things that matter. I don't think there are any ethical issues that will arise that are any more profound than some of the ones that we have to confront at the moment. So I don't think there's not going to be a kind of a, a whole sea change in, in medical ethics, I don't think. Earlier this year, you and um, theatre director Mick Gordon uh, presented a, what he called, you called, a theatre essay um, on ego, which was a contemplation of what identity is and yeah. hu humanity is, uh, inspired by your book. Um, I read that you and Mick both came to on ego with different positions which i think were characterized he was wondering whether it was possible for a person to ever change and you were puzzled about whether it was possible for a person to ever stay the same yeah. which sounds like you know kind of dramatic tension there yeah and i think we've ended up with a a kind of compromised position where we both actually believe the same things now that we that we do change. We change not just from day to day, we change from minute to minute. Um, but what persists is this story we tell ourselves. And right. It's not just a story as a pure kind of verbal narrative, it's a story of embodied narrative as well. So, um, but it's a story nevertheless. And, and So Mick got into this through, through an interest in um, psychotherapy and, and whether people really change with psychotherapy and, and if so, how did they change? Do you think? Do I think they change? I think if the psychotherapy works, they do. Um, if it doesn't work, they don't. Right. <laughs> so. But it's possible. Um, yeah. Not I just, think. well, what, to change what? To change the story? Um, to change the, you change various things. You might want to just change certain predispositions. So if, if you're agoraphobic and you're afraid to go to the supermarket, we, you know, we can change that fairly, you know, it's a fairly kind of mechanical process to change that. And if you go through the certain steps of the therapy, then chances are you'll feel a lot better than you did. So you can, you can change people in, in that sort of way. Whether, um, if you look at it, if you, people, somebody in the audience today said, uh, yeah, but what about the real deep changes? What are, how can you get really deep down and change people deep down? And the, the answer is, well, what is deep down? Yeah. Where do you end up at? And, and you know, what, did they elaborate on what they thought a deep change would be? Not really. Because when you push people back on those sort of questions, it's very hard for them to hold a grip onto the idea they thought they had, I think. If you couch it in these ego versus bundle terms, I mean, other people might come in and say, well, you know, I take a, a Freudian or a Jungian psychodynamic approach, and uh, of course there's a sense of self, and this is what it is, this is the ego. And, but if you, if, you, if you couch the argument in these terms, ego versus bundle, then it's actually very very hard to defend the ego position i should have asked you before if if you think that psychotherapy can work are you suggesting that it's it's rewiring something it's doing something physical something physical happens if it works whatever happens at a mental level 
also happens at a physical level. Right. And, you know, okay. to that extent, I'm absolutely in line with what Crick said about the neurons. Um, there is some evidence that people who've undergone psychotherapy also show different patterns of brain reactivity. Uh, it's, the evidence isn't great that there's any kind of that pathways are reconnected anyway, but I'd put my money on it. That's what they'll find when they get the instruments to look at it. That if you if you change as a person in terms of your emotional predispositions, your your aptitudes, your attitudes, then something's happened at that other level, at the biological level. Neuropsychologist Paul Brocks.